I wanted to thank the Yankees and the Mets, the only two organizations in baseball I worked for. I would like to thank all of my loyal fans who supported me all these years. I hope they are proud of me today. Also, my friends who came to share this day with me. I want to congratulate all the men who are being inducted here today. And last of all, I want to thank baseball. It has given me more than I could ever hope for. And I hope that when I'm through with this game, I will put something back. Thank you very much. You know what? That is a heck of a speech by Yogi. I have never seen that before. That's the Hall of Fame in 72. Marty Appel, who was the Yankee historian, longtime public relations director, Pinstripe Empire, one of the great Yankee books of all time. Marty, Thank good you. to have you with us. How are you today, okay? I'm great. You know, as I was looking at that film, I was looking at his dark hair, and I was remembering that one of those books that he wrote with Dave Kaplan over the last 10 years or so, the publisher colored his gray hair dark for the cover of the book. And Yogi resented it very much. He said, you know, he's a man of integrity. And that was not, not honest. That was fake. And he didn't like that very yeah. much. You know, he was never a great speaker, but he did a good job. And he might, you were the Yankees. Then he must be nervous as heck when he went up there to Cooperstown to do that speech. Yeah, he didn't like speaking. He was okay with Q&A. But that was a tough assignment for him. But he was there with Koufax. And Sandy kind of looked after him the whole weekend. Oh, really? Yeah. Very interesting. Now, you remember Yogi as a player. Well, let's do that first. Okay. Uh, per uh, how about 56? Perfect game, then the two homers in game seven. He's, he's almost shadowed to a degree by Dimaj and then Mantle, but he's the, he's the best Yankee after those two for a 12, 13-year period. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, Casey always called him Mr. Barra and my assistant manager, and he gave him a respect that the writers had not given him before oh, really? Casey got there. They thought of him as a comic book reading fool, and Casey made them see him in another way, as a very intuitively smart guy, certainly on the field, but not somebody to be an object of ridicule. Well, I didn't realize that, so Casey turned that uh, yes. image of, of, of Yogi around, which is interesting. Okay, you get there in 68, and Yogi was with the Mets. He had been fired from the Yankees, of course, after 64 with Game right. 7. Yeah. Here comes Johnny Keane. So you get there, and Yogi's back in 76 as a coach of Billy Morton, who he did not like that much, Billy Morton. Is that correct? Uh, he was okay with uh, He was Morton. okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, how about him there as a coach there in 76? Let me well, hear. what I want to say is, you know, he was one of my heroes, and now I'm going to work with him. He's going to be a coach. He comes back in 76. I'm the PR director. So at the press conference, he kind of makes an effort to get to know me and even asks my extension on the phone system. Really? And starting the next day, I would get an early afternoon call every day. My secretary, Ann Milio, would say, Yogi on line six, and I couldn't wait. And I'd pick it up, and he'd go, what do you hear? Any rumors? Any gossip? <laughs> he loved to have that. <laughs> he loved that stuff. No, he loved that stuff. Uh, now, he was there with the Yankee coaching staff for a while, and then he takes over the ball club from George. Now, you're gone at this point. Yeah. Because you're working for uh, at the commissioner's office, I believe, in the early 80s. And him and George, obviously, George firing him through Clyde King early in his second season at Comiskey Park. How about that for a sec? Um, what it did ultimately was raise his respect in the eyes of fans tremendously. In those years that he was estranged from the team, he stood on principle, and suddenly everybody saw Yogi as a man of high character, high integrity, high principle. When he retired as a player, Chris, he and Bill Dickey were thought of equally. Today, most people would say, oh, Yogi was the greatest catcher the Yankees ever had. Not to take anything away from Dickey, but the way he lived his life post-baseball elevated his stature in the and, eyes of And players. he always honored Dickey because when oh, he yeah. broke in, Dickey did a great job as a coach for him. So Yogi made sure he broke in the catchers when he moved him to left field. He did a good job with Ellie Howard, for instance. That's right. He did a good job what Dickey did for him. Is that correct? There was a time that almost every catcher in the American League, Gus Triandos, Clint Courtney, Sherm Waller, you name them, they all had been Yogi understudies who couldn't make it in New York, and they wound up elsewhere. Yogi just reigned supreme. Uh, the Yogi George uh, scenario, did, was, was Yogi almost embarrassed that it went 13 years before he was sort of welcomed back to Yankee Stadium? Well, the, I was there at the Yogi Berra Museum the night that Susan Waldman brought, broke him the, brought him together. And he was still pacing around saying, I don't know if I want to do this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but to his credit, Mr. Steinbrenner came and they sat in Dave Kaplan's office 
And the first thing that Mr. Steinbrenner says, well, well, well I want to apologize for what went on. And Yogi put him right at ease, said, well, I made mistakes too. He didn't have to say that, because I don't know as he did. Sure didn't have to say that. But he knew how to just ease the tension. Yeah, he didn't have, how about from a baseball acumen standpoint? You, uh, I mean, we all, you mentioned that Stengel sort of made everybody realize how smart he was. Yeah. He's smart as a fox, Yogi. How about him from a baseball acumen standpoint? He just has this instinct for the game. Today, you see the uh, you, the loose leaves in the dugout with all the printouts of lefty versus righty. Head, and right? they, he knew it all. Yeah, he could remember this guy got a line drive to right field back in April off this Kirk, you know. He, oh, he knew that. Yeah. Uh, what do you think is famous? You were with him for a while. Uh, was he more proud of catching that? Per I always used to say that Robinson was out in the steel. Yeah. But was he proud of it? I know he loved, that was his greatest moment catching that perfect game, right, by, by Larson. And it was so out of character for him to leap into Larson's arms I mentioned like that. that, yeah. Yeah, because he was, you know, not, not exuberant. He just played the game in a workmanlike way. Here's a statistic for you. I'm just throwing in. I here. love it. Go ahead. In the days of double headers, you remember what a double header was? Yeah. Okay. In the days of double headers, in 1950, which was like his best offensive year, he should have won the MVP. They gave it a Rizzuto. He should right, have won it. Which would have been his first of four. Right. But anyway, the Yankees played 22 double headers that year, and he caught both ends in 19 of them. Oh my gosh! Including the flannel <laughs> uniform in the heat of the summer, including Casey had him catch both ends after the pennant was clinched in a doubleheader against Washington. Oh my goodness! <laughs> was he as annoyed getting fired after 64 Game Seven with the Cardinals as he turned out to be in '85 against the White Sox and George? He wasn't happy about it, but the firing in '85 superseded it. It was a greater offense because of the manner in which it was done. Uh, you know, not many, only Whitey, right? I mean, I know from the latter period in the late 50s, there's, you know, there's folks with us, but from that early Yankee historical scenario that really played with DiMaggio, who was left? Bobby Brown. Charlie, Bobby Brown as a couple. Okay. Charlie Silvera. Yeah, there's a, there's a few, not many. All uh, right, four weeks ago, you... Whitey Ford. Oh, Whitey Ford, uh, yeah. who I 50 broke up in 50, won his first eight, nine games. Yeah. You visited Yoki four weeks ago. Tell me something about that. Go ahead. Well... I hadn't gone to the assisted living facility where he and Carmen lived because I just felt it was a little bit of an invasion of his privacy. And then one day, a month ago, I said, what am I doing this for? He would probably, he's probably bored to death. He'd probably love somebody he had he knows to come and talk baseball with him. So with that, I went, Dave Kaplan came with me. We went to his, his room unannounced. He knew me and we sat there, we were watching uh, Michael Senate, Kay. He told me about that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we were watching a center stage with Michael Kay, with you as the guest. That's a coincidence. Right. Um, but he knew what was going on because at one point he was wearing a Yankee cap. He took off the cap. He was all bald. And he says, look at this, like Brett Gardner. So he, <laughs> he knew that. Yeah. yeah he, he was a baseball fan, true and true. And, he, you know, he had a, his post career, you know, loved the golf. He loved his little, Harvey Arrington wrote that great book with Gidry. Right. He loved to go to spring training. Yogi never, he didn't have a bad day. Yogi was, he had a good day flood even he in his had a great retirement. life and that he died peacefully without an illness, not in pain, in his sleep. It was the way you'd want Yogi to end it. And he went to go see Rizzuto every day too when Rizzuto was sick at the end. I know he used to tell me that. He used to go see Rizzuto every day, correct? And on Tuesdays, they would play bingo. <laughs> he would went, he went he two let, of them sat there playing bingo. Did he let Rizzuto win? I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Marty, wonderful job. Excellent. Always a pleasure to see you. Good to have you Thank boy you, here. Chris. Now, Marty Appel, who can tell you more great Yankee baseball stories than anybody in America. This man right there.